Hi friends, my name is Trish Roberts and you're listening to How to Go Vegan Podcast. I just want to preface this by saying that I'm so very glad you've dropped by this site. I'm sure for some the topic of veganism may be very new and what I present here will be very different to what we might encounter generally. Usually veganism is presented in a very human-centric, anthropocentric way today. If you have not thought about this issue before, it may even seem a little bit scary for some. But trust me, being vegan really is much easier than it's often made out to be. So some may ask, why create this abolitionist vegan resource in podcast form? As far as I know, there isn't one in existence to assist new vegans. I thought it might be beneficial for those who prefer obtaining information via podcasts to hear a rather informal presentation of veganism in a clear and personalized way by someone who has been vegan since early 2005 and abolitionist vegan since mid-2009. I thought it might be helpful if one can also hear a friendly voice and be able to listen to various podcast episodes in one's own time. I decided I would start with a personalized and formal introduction to my becoming vegan just to give those who are thinking about becoming vegan or who have an interest in knowing more about it the opportunity to hear a personal take on it. What do I cover in this episode? In this episode I briefly explain the differences between being vegan and abolitionist vegan and I go into more depth in other episodes on this site but for now, I'll start by talking just a little about what the catalyst was for my deciding to become vegan and what subsequent steps I took to bring myself in line with that ethical position. What the trigger was which made me decide I needed to immediately stop eating animal products and stop participating in the exploitation of animals. Then I'll talk a little on how I removed animal products from my diet and how I stopped using animals in my life and I'll touch on nutrition. Then I'll talk generally about what it's like to be vegan, what we should all avoid, and I'll chat a little about why I became abolitionist vegan four years after I became vegan. So briefly, let me introduce veganism, the ethical position. In a nutshell, veganism is an ethical position which rejects using sentient animals for food, that's dairy, eggs, meat, honey, etc., clothing, leather, fur, wool, silk, etc., entertainment, labor, and other reasons, and that includes rejecting the position that there's a quote-unquote right or quote-unquote humane way to exploit them. The vegan ethic may sound very foreign to us because it's a new way of thinking, a revolutionary way of thinking, in fact. But as the saying by George Bernard Shaw goes, all great truths begin as blasphemies. Veganism, the ethical position, runs counter to everything we've been taught about the world and about non-human animals. But being vegan is our natural inclination, something that is inside all of us when we are very, very young. It is something that almost all of us have had a predisposition to in our very early life, and tragically we lose this inclination as we are taught to ignore it and to do the opposite. From our very early life, most of us are taught that humans are superior and that this planet and everything and every animal on it is here for our enjoyment and our use. From the moment we are born, even before we are able to understand what we are doing, society, including our family and friends, is reinforcing the belief that our preferences, desires and needs, no matter how trivial, trump the fundamental interests and rights of non-human animals. Sadly, we've distanced ourselves as a species over thousands of years from our fellow animals and from the natural world to a large extent, and we have forgotten that we are animals too. As children, we often display a natural curiosity towards other animals, and often as children our response when we find out that the food on our plates is in fact the bodies of our animal friends we often get upset and want to stop eating them. My two nieces, in fact, expressed this to me when they were six and eight. In our very early life, before our indoctrination begins, we have a predisposition to being vegan. 
It isn't something that is foreign to us. It exists in us already. But most of us end up following the herd mentality. We forget our initial response. As children, we are told stories of quote-unquote happy animals on farms, with, of course, the omission of the reality that no matter how well those animals are treated, that they are still used as resources, and in the end, they are killed. The indoctrination is so relentless, and animal use is so pervasive, that we eventually just go along with the mistaken belief, this speciesist belief, that non-human animals are quote-unquote lesser, because they are other, because they are different to us, because they do not have the supposed sophisticated cognitive abilities we have. Yes, we do not have many of the abilities that they have. Does that make us lesser? Of course not. But for some reason we do not apply this same reasoning to them. And gradually, we are not able to see them as sentient beings at all. And we exploit them because they are vulnerable, and because we can. And just as with any discrimination that otherizes human individuals and human groups and makes them seem lesser, in our eyes, our speciesism obscures non-human animals' very obvious sentience, their self-awareness and interest in their own life, and this allows us to use them as objects, things, and resources. But it takes a substantial and concerted effort on our part to keep up this facade and to ignore their sentience. And sometimes the truth bursts through and causes us cognitive dissonance, a great discomfort in us. And here we arrive at my story on how I awoke from my speciesist haze and became vegan. Until I became vegan, I always thought of myself as having a quote-unquote love of animals. I believe I respected them. When I was young, I particularly loved the bearded dragons who dotted ours and our neighbor's fence. As I grew older, I would be horrified if I heard about any instance of animal cruelty and abuse, and if I found an injured or lost animal, I would do my absolute best to do something to help those animals. In retrospect, I obviously recognize their sentience, but like so many today who are not vegan, I was making arbitrary moral distinctions between those I shared my home with, or those who lived in my garden, or in forests and national parks, and those who were on my plate. But all these sentient animals, whether they be a dog or cat who share our home, or a pig, sheep, goat, cow, or chicken, just like us, they have self-awareness, individual personalities, likes and dislikes, they form relationships with others and the world, they love their life and care for their young, and they do not want to suffer and do not want to die. And whether we want to admit to ourselves or not, whether we believe it or not, the truth is there is no moral difference between us and any of these species. During my life, I've always had an interest and involved myself in human social justice issues. I saw myself as a believer in justice and nonviolence. This was a view I had of myself. It was only until I became vegan that I realized there was a whole huge area of my life where I completely lacked insight. Until I became vegan, I had a very human-centric way of viewing the world, and as a result of that, I had a very limited and discriminatory view of justice and nonviolence. I was completely deluding myself. To realize this later came as quite a shock for me, and I will explain how this unfolded. For me, the moment I realized I had to become vegan was one day when I was online, and I came across some details about the dairy industry. I can't even remember where I read these details about the dairy industry. But I remember being appalled and thinking to myself, how could this be allowable? I read that it was the normal functioning of the dairy industry for male calves to be taken from their mothers at a few days old, barely able to walk, and transported to a slaughterhouse to be killed, the reason being that they were of no use to the dairy industry. I read that the mothers would be distraught, crying out, and trying to prevent their baby from being taken from them, and the calves would be distressed and crying. And this was all normal. 
I can't remember everything I read, but it was horrifying to me, and I remember talking about it to my partner, and just astonished that this could be allowable in any way. Yet it was clear to me these practices by the dairy industry were not only deemed completely acceptable, but were typical and seen as necessary. And this treatment of dairy cows and their calves was completely endorsed by government bodies as well. After this revelation, I felt as if someone had thrown a bucket of icy water over me. I remember that moment very clearly. It was like I had suddenly snapped out of an illusion that I had been living all my life. It was a great shock. I then talked to my partner about this and then learned how chickens are slaughtered. That was horrifying. And as amazing as this, this sounds to me now, I hadn't even really given much thought to how animals were killed. I hadn't really thought much about any of this. I had basically been living an unconscious life. My experience, mostly up to this point, was that on the planet there were humans and there were animals. Animals were not seen by society as our moral equals because they were different to us, a different species with different characteristics and different cognitive abilities to us. And because of these differences, we have been instructed to believe that they are of lesser moral importance than we are. How powerful is speciesism that we can be so easily led to believe such a false notion? These types of positions are often taken as a given in our society at one time or another. We not only otherize non-human animals, but we otherize groups of humans, because we believe them to be different to us and therefore lesser. Most of us claim to, quote-unquote, love animals, or at least most of us believe it is wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals, don't we? We claim we are against animal cruelty, and yet most of us have no clue what we are participating in when we sit down to our meals or when we buy certain clothes and shoes or when we visit zoos and so forth. We just do not think about it. We take for granted that animals are here for us, whether they are domesticated or in the quote-unquote wild. We, our parents, their parents, and so forth, generations for thousands of years, have been taught that animals are here for us to look at, to comfort us, for us to use as resources, to labor for us, for entertainment, and so forth. And so we don't think about it. We might think about it if we are hearing the news about a truck overturning and pigs being killed, or when the news reports on the horrors of live export. We might think about it briefly if we hear of an animal escaping a slaughterhouse, or if we hear of horrific instances of animal abuse, but generally animals and what we do to them does not enter our consciousness much, if at all. Why does it not enter our minds much, if at all? Partly it's because animal industry has kept much of animal use and, and slaughter hidden from us. But now, due to the Internet, in recent years animal exploitation is more widely documented. Large animal organizations like to tell us that there are quote-unquote better and quote-unquote humane ways to exploit animals, and they reassure us they will be the quote-unquote watchdog for industry and that we should just give them our money. And our donation, we then believe, is all we need to do to discharge our moral obligations to animals, and they will fix the problem. The truth is, we just do not want to think about what we are doing to animals. We just do not want to know because to know means we might have to care and to acknowledge animals' obvious sentience. And to care would mean we would have to change our behavior and we would rather not do that. So we live in a state of enduring ignorance and to some extent willful ignorance. And for some of us, tragically, this state never alters. For some of us, we live in this state our whole lives and die never realizing what we have been participating in. But back to my response after reading details about the dairy industry. 
I realized to my horror that all those years that I have been vegetarian, all those years eating dairy, cheese, butter, yogurt, etc., I had been participating in this tremendous violence. But it didn't stop there, because I realized that if I thought that eating dairy and the terrible violence that that entails was wrong, what about all the other forms of animal exploitation? To single out one form of animal exploitation to reject seems somewhat silly. I thought if I think this is wrong, then other forms of animal use are wrong as well. It was like something had been lifted from my eyes. I also felt outrage. I don't know what I thought happened in slaughterhouses before this day. I was embarrassed and quite appalled at myself that I could be so thoughtless, that I didn't think, that I had barely thought about it in any real way at all. It might have crossed my mind briefly when there was some incident involving animal cruelty, but I, as so many others do, had pretty much taken for granted the whole situation of animals being exploited as normal. As far as I knew, everyone viewed them this way, and there was no question about whether it was morally justifiable or not to use them. It had been completely normalized, so much so that questioning it for most people would seem ridiculous. So on this day of my awakening in early 2005, it was a few months before Donald Watson, who originally coined the word vegan in 1944, died at age 95. On this day, my partner and I decided that we must stop using animal products. I had never really thought about veganism. I had heard the term vegan a couple of times. I had some idea what it meant, but I really didn't know much. I really can't remember much about how I went about removing animal products and animal use from my life, but I remember doing research online, and it was relatively simple. Within a short period of time, I was eating a diet of whole grains, legumes, fresh peas and beans, lentils and other pulses, pasta, a wonderful array of vegetables and fruits, berries, nuts and seeds, and the combinations were unending. There were some minor hiccups on how my decision to be vegan was received by my relatives, and I'm sure some still don't understand it or want to understand it, but my mother in particular was very accommodating, and when we would visit, she would provide vegan food for us. We found that when we would attend family gatherings, we would bring along delicious vegan food, and we realized people enjoyed it at least as much as the non-vegan food. If I may, I would like to give a few tips. It's a good idea prior to any events to think about the types of things that people might say to you if they find out you're vegan, and to have a good response. It's important to always remain calm and patient, even with those who are being a bit aggressive or who might mock you, because they are most likely the ones who might wake up to veganism down the track. The fact that they have such strong reactions means something resonates within them. So remain calm, and if they continue to be aggressive and are not listening, just excuse yourself from the conversation. It is very important to not introduce a discussion about veganism while people are eating animal products. That is the least likely occasion where someone will be receptive to the message. Another important thing to remember is to never forget that almost all of us were all non-vegan at some point in our life. Some who claim they are vegan sometimes make misanthropic remarks to non-vegans, but this is counterproductive and a form of violence. The abolitionist vegan movement is about non-violence. It is not helpful at all and it is hypocritical to humiliate, hate and demean people because they are not vegan, particularly since the non-vegan public are our target audience for vegan education. As far as research online goes, I would not recommend any sites from large animal organizations because of their moral confusion, their promotion of regulation of animal exploitation and single-issue campaigns, and because they do not promote veganism, if at all, in any clear, morally consistent way. But I'll talk about this issue later, as it's a very important one. But back to the issue of removing animal products from our diet. That was quite easy because there are many yummy and healthy plant-based alternatives for dairy. 
We realized that we would need to do more cooking, and although I wasn't really much of a cook at the time, I found that there's lots of easy vegan recipes, and my cooking skills improved greatly within a year. I found there were thousands of excellent recipes online which were delicious. Now I'm quite a good cook and can make delicious Indian curries, soups, pastries, cakes, and the list goes on. Never let it be said that vegan food is boring. It just isn't. Many years later, I'm still learning about new recipes and ways of doing things, and I enjoy veganizing recipes as well. As well as removing animal products like dairy, meat, eggs, honey, and so forth from my diet, I removed animal source clothing and leather footwear from my life, and over time, anything else I noticed. Something we need to understand when we decide to go vegan is that the key to a successful transition and to remaining vegan is to thoroughly internalize the ethical position. Then it isn't difficult to endure a little discomfort sometimes or a little inconvenience, and it isn't difficult to remove leather shoes or woolen coats or silk or any animal source product from our lives. And the longer we are vegan, the more profound this position becomes. Wearing the skin of a cow or any other animal would be as repulsive and morally objectionable to me now as it would be to wear the skin of a human or own an item which is made of human skin. I just couldn't imagine wearing someone's skin on my feet any more. So this decision of mine was reinforced after I did some research online and realized the tremendous violence involved in the production of silk, wool, leather, down, and so forth. And after this research, it was not difficult to abandon those products. And after a year, I was already leaning strongly to becoming abolitionist. It was only when I became abolitionist in mid 2009 and consolidated my position that the issue of how animals were treated was no longer an issue, because the problem was that they were being used at all. That was the issue. As I've mentioned, and I repeat it often because it's so important, the key to becoming vegan and staying vegan is to internalize the ethical position, and that's where informing oneself by reading morally consistent animal ethics material and books by authors who advocate that veganism is the moral baseline is such an important part of becoming vegan. But I will talk about the issue in more depth in other episodes. There is an entire section dedicated to this issue of abolitionist veganism. As someone said once, quote, "I am vegan because, after much learning and thought about the issue, I have come to see enslaving, exploiting, or intentionally killing an animal as morally equivalent to enslaving, exploiting, or intentionally killing a child. The only difference is one is socially acceptable and the other is socially unacceptable." That may sound shocking or extreme to some people, but it is only because we are so acculturated to devalue sentient non-human beings to the status of things. What is truly extreme is the violence of intentionally killing one trillion land and aquatic animals annually, globally, for unnecessary food preferences alone. Unless you consider non-violence and justice to be extreme, veganism is not extreme. I think that quote expresses my feelings on the issue very well. And now I'll briefly talk about the issue I next investigated as a new vegan, and that was creating a balanced diet so that I obtain the maximum amount of nutrition. Firstly, let me share with you a part of a statement by a mainstream organization, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, about a vegan diet. Quote. It is the position of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics that appropriately planned vegetarian diets, including total vegetarian or vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. Well-planned vegetarian diets are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, and adolescence, and for athletes. End quote. But despite this, we see a lot of misinformation and disinformation about whether or not a plant-based diet is healthy. 
It only takes one incident of a vegan eating poorly and suffering a bad health outcome for mainstream media to pounce on this. And mainly that's because animal industry is a very powerful and influential industry and pays for advertising in these media sources. Of course, there's little mention about the hundreds of thousands who die each year of strokes, heart disease, diabetes, colon cancer, etc., which are directly related to consumption of animal products. In fact, the World Health Organization has put processed meat in the same category as tobacco as a carcinogen. So the science is in. We just have a much better chance of being healthy, having peace of mind, and living longer if we are not consuming animal products, along with reducing our alcohol intake and getting regular exercise. The truth is a balanced plant-based diet is completely healthy. But anyone can eat an unhealthy, unbalanced diet. For optimum health, one needs to plan a balanced nutritional diet whether one is vegan or not. I wish I had known the truth about the real impact of animal product consumption on my health when I was younger. I thought I had a reasonable understanding of nutrition having been a health professional, but just like most people, I had been fed a lot of misinformation. Even health professionals are misinformed or underinformed. Curing rather than prevention is often the approach of Western medicine. And due to the power animal industries and pharmaceutical industries wield, mainstream media, despite the science, do their best to keep the propaganda going that eating animal products is desirable and essential to one's health and is essential to obtaining protein, omega fatty acids and calcium. But this is untrue. If one looks at the science, medical journals and books like the China study, which is the largest global nutrition study undertaken to this day, we find that not only is a diet of animal products in the amounts we consume causing strokes, cardiac disease, colon cancer, kidney disease, diabetes and other major illnesses, but it becomes clear we are just not meant to be putting these products into our bodies. Yet we feed innocent children who have no say in it a diet of animal products. It's very sad indeed. In short, putting aside the main reason we should stop using animals is because we are participating in the torture and murder of over one trillion land and aquatic animals each year for trivial reasons of habit, pleasure, tradition and convenience. Our animal use is killing us and it is an ecological disaster and a major contributor to climate change. In fact, the contribution from animal agriculture is 51% of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. I'll speak a little about the ecological disaster now. Here's a few facts from the sustainability secret. Quote, Animal agriculture accounts for at least 32,000 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per year, or 51% of all worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. Methane and nitrous oxide are rarely mentioned in climate talks although those two greenhouse gases are, respectively, 86 times and 296 times more destructive than carbon dioxide. Cows worldwide produce 150 billion gallons of methane daily, and 65% of the nitrous oxide produced by human-related activities is caused by the animal agriculture industry. Water used in fracking ranges from 70 billion to 140 billion gallons annually. Animal agriculture water consumption ranges from 34 trillion to 76 trillion gallons annually. Raising animals for human consumption takes up to 45% of the planet's land. 91% of, of the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest and up to 80% of global rainforest loss are caused by clearing land for the grazing of cows and growing feed crops for animals used for their flesh and for their secretions. As more and more rainforest disappears, the planet loses one of its primary means to safely sequester carbon dioxide. The animal agriculture industry is also a principal cause of species extinction and the creation of more than 95,000 square miles of nitrogen-flooded dead zones in the ocean. In short, a person who eats a vegan diet, a diet free of meat, dairy and eggs, 
saves 1,100 gallons of water, 45 pounds of grain, 30 square feet of forested land, 20 pounds of CO2 equivalent, and prevents the torture and killing of at least one animal every day. So that's an edited quote from the sustainability secret. I could spend a very long time talking about the ecological disaster and humanitarian disaster that we participate in when we eat animal products and use animals. But I think it's pretty clear, even by that brief description, that if we truly claim to care about climate change, or as I prefer to call it these days, climate collapse, and if we truly care about non-human animals and the environment, then it starts with us. Science-backed non-animal studies reveal that a plant-based diet is superior to a diet of animal products. I would urge anyone who is thinking of becoming vegan, or even those who have been vegan for some time, to check out the site nutritionfacts.org by Michael Grieger, and get a hold of the book How Not to Die by him as well. And a quick disclaimer, please note I do not necessarily endorse any individual, organization, social media page, group, opinion or site that I mention on my site, nor do I in any way financially profit in my vegan education efforts. But having said that, I mention nutritionfacts.org because I think it's probably the best plant-based nutrition site by far, since there's literally hundreds of excellent science-backed short visual presentations on all kinds of topics related to plant-based nutrition. I would also like to note that I didn't know about this site until a few years after I became vegan. I found a lot of very useful and important information there. I invite you to please look at the presentations in particular on B12, omega fatty acids and vitamin D. I want to talk a little bit about B12 because this is very important and something vegans need to pay attention to. But before I do, I want to point out that if one is eating a balanced plant-based diet, one can obtain all the nutrients, minerals and vitamins one requires, with the exception of B12. There's no need for vegans to take lots of supplements because a balanced vegan diet is brimming with nutrition. And by the way, vegans get 75% more protein daily than they actually need. Many non-vegans tend to miss out on many trace minerals and vitamins due to heavily relying on animal products. The only vitamin I would stress that is essential to our health that is missing from a plant-based diet is B12. B12 comes from a microbe. It used to be found everywhere on vegetables and water before we sanitized and processed everything. So now as vegans we need to take it in the form of a supplement. There will be vegans who will tell you this is not necessary, but trust me when I say the science says it is necessary. I cannot stress how essential it is that vegans supplement with B12, or at the very least take plant-based B12 fortified foods. We need at least approximately 2,500 micrograms of B12 each week to be healthy. If vegans do not receive enough B12, one outcome can be that homocysteine levels in the blood rise. Homocysteine is a byproduct of protein metabolism. Why is this a problem? Elevated homocysteine levels are linked with increased risks of heart disease and stroke. Many studies have compared the homocysteine levels of vegans who do not supplement their diet with vitamin B12 to those of non-vegans. Every study revealed that vegans had a higher homocysteine level than the non-vegans and these levels were elevated enough to be associated with heart disease and stroke. Low B12 levels can contribute to Alzheimer's. So all the tremendous benefits we get from a plant-based diet eventually will be undone by not supplementing with B12. B12 supplements are cheap and easy to find online and in chemists and taking them daily is a little hardship when we think about the harm we cause to animals and the harm we cause to ourselves and to the planet by consuming meat including fish, dairy, eggs and so forth. Anyway, the important point here is that we must ensure we are getting a balanced nutritional diet. 
The other action I took when first becoming vegan was looking up vegan recipes online and pr- improving my cooking skills. It was quite exciting, really. I also tried to be aware and learn how to read ingredients on labels when shopping because some products are accidentally vegan, but also sometimes makers of accidentally vegan products can change their formula at any time. Suddenly their products are not vegan anymore, so that's why it is important to read the ingredients on labels regularly and look some of the trace ingredients that you might not be familiar with because oftentimes some ingredients look like they might be harmless enough but turn out to be animal sourced. There's this myth out there in the mainstream that vegans need to buy specialized food, pre-made expensive commercial vegan products, fake vegan quote-unquote meat products or that we have to eat organic products. And because of this myth, it is often put out there as well that it's expensive and somewhat elitist to be vegan. That's simply not true. Sure, there are some new vegans who might go the way of eating faux animal quote-unquote meats while they are transitioning, but this is something that is not necessary. And oftentimes the faux animal products have little nutrition value and are full of salt and sugar. And although some new vegans who are transitioning might choose to eat some faux vegan meat products, often the interest in this diminishes over time. The truth is vegans are not missing out on anything by becoming vegan, and even if in the rare times we are, that's okay. But there's absolutely delicious recipes that are quite simple to make, which are not emulating animal flesh and other animal products. My diet is delicious. It comprises mostly whole foods, beans, nuts, fruits, seeds. It's easy and it's cheap. Middle Eastern, Indian, Latin American, Thai, Italian, the list goes on of the wonderfully delicious vegan recipes one can enjoy. And even if there is no supermarket nearby, people can get together to form groups and either order bulk pulses, beans, rice and other grains or find ways that they can access them. Beans and grains are cheap and often accessible. If we have internalized the ethical position that it's wrong to use animals for any purpose, then there will always be ways we can devise to get access to the foods we need. But back again to trace animal ingredients. There's too many non-vegan ingredients found in food and products to mention in this episode and that's why it's good to do research online. Each year there's more and more information online so it's becoming much easier to do research. But I would like to point out that there are many sites which call themselves vegan which are completely human centric and which have little to do with ethics. They are not only morally confused and promote regulation of animal use, they endorse happy animal products. They also promote the idea that trace ingredients are not something we should be concerned with. There's even so-called vegan sites which say that eating honey is fine. If we take our ethical commitments seriously, then we should do our best to avoid animal products including trace ingredients as best we can. I've included some of the most common non-vegan ingredients here. One is casein, which is a protein found in milk. Unfortunately, this is regularly found in soy cheeses. Carmine or cominic acid, also known as cochineal, natural red 4, C175470 or E120, is made from crushed cochineal insects. The insects have bright red shells. They are also used as a red food coloring. Beeswax is another one. This comes from honeybees. And I'll leave some information on the site about honey and why honey isn't vegan and the many alternatives to honey. Gelatin is another substance produced from the collagen in animal bones and hooves. Gelatin is often used for marshmallows, lollies and in jelly. It is also used as a thickener and as a preservative. Some alcoholic beverages surprisingly use animal products for example, icing glass, egg albumin, dairy, or bone char to filter wines, beers, and liqueurs. There's a site called barnivore.com which has a lot of information about vegan alcohol, but it's also good to regularly check with suppliers. 
Lactose is another animal ingredient from protein in milk, but it is interesting to note that lactic acid is almost always vegan. Lanolin is a fat substance found in the wool of sheep. Vitamin D3 is often found in many soy milks or fortified juices. Vitamin D3 comes from lanolin, which is a sheep product. D2, however, is plant-based, but you can find vegan vitamin D3s as well. For example, as far as I'm aware, Vitashine D3 is vegan. But it's always good to do one's research and ask the suppliers of products. And if I may give some advice, anyone, whether vegan or not, should consider having one's vitamin D blood levels taken every year or so to see if one is D deficient. Because today, there is widespread D deficiency even for people who would assume they are receiving adequate sunlight exposure. And this widespread D deficiency globally, particularly for people with high levels of melanin in their skin, can lead to serious life-threatening diseases like cancer, diabetes and so forth. So vitamin D, whether you're vegan or non-vegan, is an important issue. Whey is a milk protein often used as a protein boost in some commercial foods. In some countries, bone char is used in the production of sugar. In my country, Australia, charcoal and other non-animal sourced processes are mostly used. There's also replacements for many animal ingredients one finds in recipes. For example, eggs can be replaced with applesauce, ground flaxseed or banana. Dairy milk can be replaced with soy, oat, hemp, rice, almond milk, etc. There's a lot of information online about vegan replacements and recipes. Now I'd like to talk about an impulse one can have after becoming a new vegan. Sometimes when one first becomes vegan, there can be a strong impulse to want to help stop violence against animals. And while that's a good impulse, we can get drawn into counterproductive, speciesist and even destructive and violent ways of trying to achieve this. We think becoming involved in large animal organizations will help direct us. I would like to warn against this. Large animal organizations can seem very glamorous and exciting and can feel like they provide a kind of supportive anchor as a new vegan. But sadly, large animal charities have become all about themselves in their bottom line. Any mo motivation they may have had in the beginning has been buried under fundraising single-issue campaigns to keep their bloated organizations afloat. I'm not saying that everyone working in these organizations has bad motivations, not at all. But one must consider that many employees and supporters of these large animal organizations and who claim to be vegan must have a certain level of speciesism to be able to promote regulation of animal exploitation and to endorse what abolitionists like to call quote-unquote happy animal products or quote-unquote happy animal exploitation. The fact is that all large animal organizations do not have veganism as their moral baseline. They speak out of both sides of their mouths, claiming that on one hand we should not use animals for at all for any purpose, or that there's no such thing as quote-unquote humane animal use, but then they regularly promote regulation of animal exploitation, welfare reform, or worse, promote, endorse, or profit from the promotion of quote-unquote humane animal products, welfare labels for animal industry. For example, Freedom Foods, or the five-step animal welfare labels. You will hear representatives of these so-called quote-unquote animal rights organizations claim that they have to be quote-unquote pragmatic, or they will say that quote-unquote eating a little less meat, which is called reducitarianism, is beneficial, or that quote-unquote reducing cruelty is on the way to abolition of animal exploitation, but all these positions are speciesist and wrong-headed and involve violence. If history has taught us anything, we have had animal welfare for over 200 years now and little has changed. In fact, greater numbers of animals are being exploited in more horrific ways than ever before. But if you are not convinced and think that welfare regulations protect animals from unnecessary cruelty and that you believe this is a good thing. The simple fact is, no, it does not protect animals. 
Aside from the fact that use itself is unnecessary, since we can be vegan, and almost always involves harm, welfare regulations do almost nothing that owners of animal property wouldn't already do to protect their property. Even in cases where producers want to protect their animal property, it is not cost-effective to prevent frequent and extreme cruelty. The very nature of animal exploitation is abusive and cruel. Producers accept, as a cost of doing business, some loss of life from cruelty. Dozens, if not hundreds, of undercover videos of employees and slaughterhouse workers torturing animals show this routine, quote-unquote, cost of doing business, cruelty. In addition, animals bred for human uses are almost always genetically modified to suit the purpose of their use. And this often causes severe harm to the animal due to extreme weight or extreme egg or milk production capacity depleting them of nutrition. Combined with the fact that animals confined in unnatural conditions during their lives and slaughter itself is cruel and terrifying, animals live lives of pain and suffering even in the quote-unquote best conditions. In the worst and most common conditions, such cruelty is unimaginable. And yet again, our use of their bodies and fluids is completely unnecessary. The fact is that despite large so-called quote-unquote animal rights organizations endorsing welfare reform and reaping tremendous profits by promoting single-issue campaigns, if we truly believe animal exploitation is wrong, then there's no quote-unquote good way or morally acceptable way to exploit them. We must reject it all and that means we need to go vegan ourselves and educate others to do so. There's no such thing as non-abusive exploitation and even if there were, in the end, they all wind up in the same horrific slaughterhouse. So even if there was such a thing as humane use of animals, which there could never be, it would still be morally wrong to use them. As I mentioned earlier, the abolitionist position is that the issue is not how we use them, it's that we use them at all that is the problem. And that's why the nonviolent grassroots abolitionist movement is the most important social justice movement we can join today. It has no leaders, it's just a global group of committed individuals working to abolish the property status of animals through nonviolent vegan education. Public education is one of the most important ways of turning the tides of discrimination in any meaningful and lasting way. It's never been achieved through violence or control. It's where we should be if we believe that animals deserve at least one fundamental right the right not to be used as a resource. Nothing meaningful and lasting will happen for animals while they are property. And something we need to consider is that if any of these welfare reforms were applied to humans, it would be considered torture. So why am I mentioning this? As I said, it's often an impulse when we become vegan to want to do something, and we look for an outlet for this. And we might join a large animal organization and also make a donation to them. We want to feel a part of something. We want to feel supported. But what we don't realize is that large animal charities are businesses. Instead, I have a suggestion which will produce much better results for animals. Why not join the grassroots nonviolent abolitionist movement? A movement where we promote an unequivocal vegan message and veganism is up front and center. We will avoid the exhaustion of the unending species of single-issue campaigns which go nowhere. We will avoid the unending undercover investigations which put forth the idea that there's a better way to exploit animals. Hopefully, we want all exploitation to end and we recognize exploitation, no matter how humane we claim it to be, is all equally morally wrong. That's what we owe other animals, a clear vegan message. I would urge anyone who becomes vegan to not waste their time and money with these counterproductive single-issue campaigns and with large animal organizations. 
I would urge anyone new to becoming vegan or who is not familiar with abolitionist veganism as a concept to read some of the recommended books I have linked to on this site to understand the ethical position clearly. That will stand you in good stead if ever there is societal pressure or pressure by friends and family to abandon veganism. Contrary to most of the misinformation out there in the public sphere, vegan is not a diet, it's not a fad, it's not a health kick, it's not optional, it's not about reducing cruelty, it's not daunting or purist or extreme or crazy or a lifestyle or a personal choice or a matter of personal morality or personal purity. It's not consumerism, it's not a religion and it's not forcing one's own personal beliefs onto anyone. It's a justice issue just like any issue which, which addresses the objectification and exploitation of any sentient being. It's an ethical position which recognizes the sentience of non-human animals, recognizes them as moral persons, and recognizes their very basic right not to be used as a resource, as property. So let's keep this in mind when we see the far-reaching arms of large animal organizations trying to rope us into their moral confusion. It might look good, but as I've said, they are businesses and ethics and animals have taken a backseat to their fundraising. And let's also remember that there is no species that is more morally important than another, and there's no form of animal use that is worse than another. So when we promote veganism, we recognize that all species, including our own, are equally morally important, and that all forms of animal use are equally morally unjustifiable and wrong. That's something we need to internalize. As abolitionists, something else that is important is, as a logical extension of justice, we need to reject all forms of discrimination. Racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, obliism, and so forth. Why? Because if we reject speciesism, as a logical extension, we should also reject any discrimination which causes violence because all discrimination is based on otherizing individuals based on irrelevant criterion such as race, sex, sexual orientation, class, and so forth. All forms of discrimination are connected, and it's logical we should reject any discrimination which otherizes any sentient being, no matter what group they belong to, whether they be human or non-human. That's part of the abolitionist vegan ethic. I must also mention that abolitionist vegans advocate the importance of adopting and fostering non-human animals from shelters, particularly those who are disabled and or elderly. We created this mess for them, and we have a moral obligation to care for these refugees of domestication. We also advocate supporting the non-human residents of farm animal sanctuaries. We urge sanctuaries to clearly promote veganism. One sanctuary which does this is Peaceful Prairie Sanctuary in Colorado in the U.S. I'll talk more about why it's important for sanctuaries to have a clear vegan message in another episode. In conclusion, I'd just like to say that for many of us who become vegan, it has a profound and wonderful impact on our lives. It certainly has for me. But it's not until some time after we go vegan that we fully realize how profound and wonderful it, it is. Veganism is a great gift. It is the solution to many of the world's problems today, not the least of which is that if we think we can oppress and exploit the most vulnerable in the world today, non-human animals, then clearly our behavior, our injustice and our violence doesn't stop there. Being vegan doesn't make us special or superior not exploiting non-human sentient beings is the minimum standard of decency. We never had the moral right to exploit these innocent sentient beings whose only crime is that they were born in other species. Becoming vegan and refusing to participate in their exploitation and murder, no matter how humane the claims might be, is the least we can do. So I'll leave it here. I've lightly explored a number of issues. I hope I've done so in a clear way in this introduction. Hopefully, I've given you some helpful information 
on my personal experience of becoming vegan and associated matters. I'm not an expert by any means. I don't claim to be. I'm not an academic, nor do I follow any individual or belong to any group or organization. And I'm not peddling anything. I'm just a person sharing my experiences on what I consider important and helpful information in relation to veganism and being vegan, and that is my intention for this podcast. I hope some of my year's experience as an abolitionist vegan has given some insights that you might find beneficial. My apologies if if I have unintentionally misrepresented any issues here. It was not intentional. There's a lot of misinformation and distortion of what abolitionist veganism is online and elsewhere, and I hope in my own way I may have been able to help clarify some of these misperceptions and misrepresentations. There's a lot more I could say here, but I'll elaborate on various issues mentioned here in other episodes, and I hope you will investigate further in the links I have provided. I am sure that becoming vegan will turn out to be one of the best decisions you make in your life. It certainly was for me. It's not an exaggeration at all to say this. It's not all we need to be to live a non-violent and just life. It's a first step, and it's certainly what we all need to be if we ever expect to enjoy peace on this planet. It is my pleasure and privilege to be able to share this information with you. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.